Nos oedd dda a chroeso cynnes i chi gyd heno i Hustings Age Cymru. A very warm welcome to you all to the Hustings of Age Cymru ahead of the Senedd elections. My name is Rhodri Abowen and I work for a public affairs company in Cardiff Bay called Positive and I will be chairing this evening. If anything happens to my internet connection or the technology, my colleague Naomi Williams is waiting patiently in the wings and will take over. Diochiti Naomi. Uh, Mivid hon a noson veithog. This will be a bilingual evening. Um, thanks to Neris Herford, the um, translator here. Diochiti Neris. If you are not a Welsh speaker and you need to listen to any Welsh spoken this evening interpreted into English, you'll need to look for the globe sign at the bottom of your screen and select English. If you're joining via an iPad, um, look for the three dots and then more and then interpreting and then English. Interpretation is only available on the Zoom app and is not available on Chromebook. A gosod i chi yn siarad Cymraeg, peidiwch a phoen ni o gwbl dos dim angen i chi wneud yn byd. The, um, the slide shows the globe and the English then, so just follow the instructions on the slide here if you are a non-Welsh speaker. We would love to hear your comments this evening as the hustings go, uh, as we go through the questions with the politicians. So please do use the chat facility. And you have, if you are tweeting this evening, please use the hashtag Age Cymru Hustings. Mae'n ei weithio chi bod y noson yn cael ei'r acordio a bydd yr acordiad yn cael ei osod ar wefan Age Cymru cyn hir. Dyna ni am y rhag ymadrodd a fi nawr i gyflwyno y panel sydd gyda ni heno. Y er, yn cyrcholi Plai Cymru, mae'r hyn a Piorwerth, a mae'r hyn wedi bod yn aelod o'r Senedd ers 2013 ac yn cynrychioli etholeth Ynys. The Ennis Mon Anglesey constituency. At the moment, Rhyn is the spokesperson for Plai Cymru for Health and Social Care. Welsh Conservatives. Janet has represented the constituency of Aberconwy since 2011 and is currently the Shadow Minister for the Environment, Energy and Rural Affairs. And representing the Labour Party is Julie Morgan. Julie has been a member of the Senedd since 2011 and previously represented the constituency at Westminster. Julie is currently the Deputy Minister for Health and Social Services. Very warm welcome to you all to our midst this evening. And before I proceed to the first question, I'm now going to ask Professor John Williams to say a word of welcome. Thank you to you, John. John, you need to un unmute yourself. <laughs> um, good. Uh, 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 thank you, Rodri. My, my apologies for, for disappearing. I'm afraid the rural internet isn't quite what it, it should be, but uh, it's getting better. Um, as Chair of H. Cumbria, it gives me real pleasure to uh, welcome you to this evening's Question Time uh, event. Um, I'd particularly like to mention um, uh, and give a warm welcome to our three uh, uh, members from the political parties for giving their time at what must be a very um, 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 busy part of the day for them. So uh, thank you very much. And also to thank you all for joining us uh, uh, through uh, through Zoom. Um, it, it, it really is fitting that we uh, hold this event today, the 23rd of March. Um, it's been declared a national day of reflection, so we can pay our respect to all those who passed away during the past 12 months due to covid 19. Um, the impact of the uh, pandemic has affected all of us, but it has been particularly hard for older people whose sense of loneliness and isolation, already a problem for many of them, um, has been compounded. Um, in addition, others have struggled with their own health or the health of loved ones um, 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 as a result of the um, um, pandemic. 
However, we also saw the best of people as communities across Wales rallied round to support older people by collecting shopping, collecting medicine, or by calling them to provide a reassurance. As we look over the months ahead, it's crucial that older people play a full part in the a recovery process. They must not become a forgotten generation. And the forthcoming election provides an ideal opportunity for us to talk about older people's needs and aspirations. So without further ado, I will pass back to you, Rodri, and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Williams. Also note before we start, the Queen might disappear for a couple of minutes to vote in, in, in the Senate. So Reid might, might be leaving us for, for a few minutes. But anyway, I'll go straight to the first question. And this has been submitted by Howard Thomas, Dr. Sabani Roy and Mrs. Delgado. And the first question to the panel is, if you were part of the next Welsh government, what would your party do to ensure that those who either cannot or will not use digital technology are not disadvantaged by the public or the private sector? I think I'll start with, with, with you, Julie. What would you, um, as part of the Welsh Government, do to tackle this, this big issue facing older people in Wales? Um, well, thank you very much, and um, for the invitation today, um, and I'm really pleased um, to be here. And this um, uh, question is um, very relevant, I think, to how um, older people are able to participate in society. And we do know that there are many older people who are not digitally confident. Um, they either don't have a device or they're not connected. But there's also, I think, a very important fact that many, especially older people, sometimes do want to have contact by the telephone. They want to speak to somebody or they sometimes want to see somebody. Um, so um, we um, are committed um, in Welsh uh, Labour to ensure that people are not left behind by the digital revolution that is happening. We want to see older people have the opportunity um, to um, have all the advantages of being digital. So we think it's really important that we go absolutely out of our way um, to provide um, support. Um, we have helped with providing um, gadgets, with uh, tablets um, to um, older people, um, in older people in care homes in particular, we've provided um, tablets for. And we also have um, it's what we call Digital Companions, um, which is a volunteering initiative for volunteers to help older people to become connected. But if they're not, and they don't want to, um, we are committed to ensuring that there are means of making contact um, either by telephone um, or face-to-face. Um, -face. And that's why um, we provided the funding, you know, for Age Cymru, the 400,000 um, pounds for um, a friend in need, uh, which has provided a telephone contact um, to, um, it, well, when you look at the whole of Wales, it's a limited number of older people, obviously, but it is a start on ensuring that there is a contact, a human voice that contacts the, um, uh, the older person. And I've actually sat in on those calls and I've sat in and listened um, you know, to the volunteer and to the um, older person receiving the call. It was wonderful. It was so, um, you know, uh, because both obviously enjoyed it so much. So it's initiatives like that that um, we have got to encourage. And the Welsh um, Labour will continue that sort of initiative. But of course, there's the much wider issue of how are you going to um, ensure that all the public services don't discriminate against people who aren't using, the, um, using technology. And we have, um, a, um, well, we have had a campaign with the public services to get them to expect, uh, respect the rights of older people. And I think it is a rights issue. Um, and I think that is the basis of, in Welsh Labour, our um, views on how older people should be treated. And if this is the, and if they don't, are not able or don't want to be digitally engaged, it, those rights have to be respected. And so certainly we have, um, you know, plans and everything we do to ensure that happens. And of course, I'm, I'll end now by saying that um, I'm, you know, very proud of the Welsh Labour government's record on older people's rights, particularly being the first UK nation to establish an older person's commissioner 
near mm -hmm. at the beginning of the assembly and the older persons commissioner has pushed us mm -hmm. on this issue about all the way about those people who do not want to be digitally connected so thank you Lovely. thank you julie uh, Trine, it, it, it's one thing to ensure that the public sec sector doesn't disadvantage older people who cannot or will not use technology. What would Plyde in government do to, to ensure that the private sector too uh, ensure the older people aren't disadvantaged, not just the public sector? Yeah, thank you for the uh, question. And funnily enough, it, one of the last things um, I did in the Senate before the lockdown a year ago was to present a an individual member's debate on this very issue. I think it was the 12th of February last year. Um, and there was recognition of the private sector um, aspect that you referred to there, Rodri. What, what, I, uh, what I did in that motion was to ask us to note that more and more services uh, are only available online, but that we need to recognise not everyone has access to the internet, uh, first of all, and also that not everybody is comfortable with using the internet. Now, what I wanted when it comes to the public service, uh, public sector services, is to ensure that an offline alternative is available. There was a particularly good example in my constituency. Well, no, it was Wales wide, of course, a year before last, when the, everybody needed to go through the process of applying for a new bus pass. Uh, many of you might remember that. And of course, it was only uh, online. Uh, and what my office did then was to open our doors and we had hundreds of people come in and we went through the process for them online. And that told me that the public sector needs to be able always to offer that offline um, option. Now, what I also said that there needs for Welsh Government to have a clear and open discussion with banks with businesses, with other organizations to make sure that customers aren't isolated if only online services are offered. Now, the purpose of saying that is, it's a recognition that sometimes you can't, you can't always force a business to do something, you know, that are commercial decisions that they might want to take, that they believe is in their interests uh, to move to online service only, but government should be taking the lead in liaising with them, in persuading them to remember that there are people who a, don't have access or B, really aren't comfortable. Having said that, you know, as I do with dads next door, uh, we need to make sure that we give every encouragement and help for people to try to feel more comfortable with the technology because uh, there are so many advantages, of course, to those people who can learn those skills and, of course, you're never too old. Great. Dear uh, And what about you, Janet? What would be the approach of the Welsh Conservatives? Uh, well, good evening and thank you again for inviting me along to this event. Whilst you did introduce me, and I am the Shadow Minister for Environment, Energy and Rural Affairs, I have previously held the portfolio for social care within the Senate. Um, I also represent one of the constituencies across Wales that has a, you know, a much older um, demographic and I'm the older people's champion for the Welsh Conservatives. So this issue, I would have said I'm glad it was number one because I think it's a huge issue. Now, what we have seen that has come out of the COVID is the fact that people who perhaps were reluctant to use online or become tech savvy, I think in a way, more of them have done so. I think we've seen it more. I know at Christmas I had, you know, sort of conversations with old people. My own father-in-law, 96, has, um, since COVID, has been having meetings in his own home with people internationally. So, you know, there is, there's an element of people who still feel left behind, however. I mean, we have to remember that um, over a third of older people um, which is around a quarter of a million people do not make use of the internet. For people aged over 75, this figure is 60%. All the people who do not use de digital technology are missing out. But again, we must never uh, assume that choice and take that choice away from them. Um, research suggests that offline households uh, miss out on savings of up to £560 a year from shopping and paying bills online. And that, that's quite a high sum of money to a, you know, to, to a household budget. Now, I do acknowledge that Welsh Government has taken steps to address the digital um, exclusion. It remains the case that just 51% of single pensioner households are likely to have 
um, internet access and 25% of disabled people remain digitally excluded. So we have called for the Digital Inclusion Charter to be amended so that it includes the seventh pledge. This would highlight the need to ensure that alternatives to services are offered. Not everyone feels um, comfortable accessing online accounts. I mean, I do, but I, you know, I, it takes some, you know, when we're making transactions, there's a nervousness felt. And so for, for older people, I can understand their fears when they are really the people that made the bank successful. It is now when banks are pulling away from having banks in our high streets. And I think, as has been said earlier, there needs to be a conversation between Welsh Government and our banks and businesses so that things are not removed, making it virtually impossible for anyone to do anything unless they are digital and techni technology savvy. Um, coupled with this, our manifesto will look to establish commitments to work with the UK government because I also cover a constituency that is, you know, has large parts that are rural. And I can tell you, COVID aside, the social isolation that many people feel um, living in, in rural counterparts, uh, may, it really does pro make the situation considerably worse. So I think, that, you know, we've all got to do more government and those of us who are, you know, representative of people within our communities, we've got to do more. We need better internet connections. Um, we need support for those who can't go online. Um, and we really do need to, um, you know, make more use of our libraries. I mean, we, there's been some fantastic, again, pre-COVID classes for older people. And if ever you've been to one, it's lovely to see the, the camaraderie and the spirit that comes together from people being a little reluctant to go online. But then when they go together in the community hall, um, there is a camaraderie there that they uh, that helps them to share and learn together. And of course, COVID has sadly robbed us of that opportunity. So going forward, I would like to see grants from whoever is in government to allow those those classes to go to, to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. The second question has been submitted by Jill Salter. Our question is, Beth gets a donated to help people here I I I'll dechre yn y gweithle. So, rhyn, mae pobl hyn yn dod ar y mor o brofiad i, I gweithleoedd. Be bydd y plai Cymru wneud i, I helpu pobl hyn i, I ail ddechrau fyd nôl i'r, i'r gweithle? Ie, yeah, diolch mor iawn am y cwestiwn yna, mae yn gwestiwn da iawn, mae yn faes pwysig iawn. Am y ma hwn yn faes, wrth gwrs, lle mae yna newid diwylliannol mawr wedi bod yn y blynyddoedd diwetha, lle mae uh, mwy o bobl o bosib yn dymuno gweithio yn hwyrach a defnyddio ei, ei gallu yn ei gyfrannu at yr economi a chymdeithas yn hirach, ond hefyd mwy o bobl wrth gwrs yn cael ei gorfodi uh, i weithio yn hwyrach. Ar broblem da ni wedi gweld dro ar ôl tro ydy bod um, pobl sydd o bosib yn cael eu gyrfodi weithio'n hwyrach yn cael eu gadal ar rhyw bwynt yn eu gyrfa lle bosib yn colli gwaith neu, uh, neu, neu yn canfod eu hunain mewn sefyllfa lle maen nhw'n gorol ystyried yn ffres um, pa, uh, pa lwybra uh, i uh, allagor o'i blyna nhw. Rwy'n beth sy'n siarad neud wrth gwrs ydy rhoi pob um, cyfle i uh, ail sgilio um, pa bynnag ydych, beth bynnag ydych oed chi ag un syniad sydd gan Blaid Cymru ydy i gyflwyno taleb neu voucher wrth rai miloedd o bynna ar gyfer ail hyfforddi. Sydd ddim yn rhywbeth dim ond ar gyfer pobl ifanc, um, ond ar gyfer pobl pa bynnag oed ydyn nhw, fel mm. bod y drysa yn cael ei agor i bobl i newid cyfeiriad. Uh, fydda i'n deud drwy'r amser wrth bobl ifanc. Cydiwch byth am meddwl pan ydych chi'n ddeunaw oed bod y penderfyniadau ydych chi'n ei wneud rhywun yn benderfyniadau ydych chi'n gorfod glynu at nhw am weddill y choes. Mae hynny'n wir am bobl yn ei geiniau, yn ei tri degau, pedwar degau, pum degau a hwyrach uh, hyd yn oed. Mae yna resyma pan bod pobl isio newid cyfeiriad, mm. mae yna resyma pan bod pobl yn cael ei gorfodi i newid cyfeiriad. Ar un syniad sydd ganddo ni uh, yn fy hyn, ydy i roi yr gefnogaeth ariannol ymarferol yna i bobl i ail sgilio. A drwy wneud hynny, fy ni'n wneud y datganiad gobeithio hefyd bod ail sgilio ar bobl yn agoed yn berffaith normal. 
Great, Diolch Rhyd. Um, Janet, even before COVID, uh, a lot of older people lacked the confidence maybe to re-enter the, the workplace. I think COVID has made the situation even even worse, as it? People might be um, reluctant uh, uh, to, to, to go back into the workplace, and some employees might, might be reluctant to have older people back in the workplace um, when we do go back um, to, to the office. How would the um, Welsh Conservatives help to re-encourage uh, to encourage uh, older people to re-enter the workplace? Well, I think that there are many conversations that need to be had around this. I, what I can tell you from people, you know, um, even of my own age, where they've perhaps um, they've lost their employment through, it may be that they haven't been well and they've not been able to get an operation. And so they've, you know, for whatever reason, they've lost their employment. And it can be very soul destroying when they've worked from being very young to say in their 50s and their 60s to suddenly see themselves. Um, it, it's so demoralizing. It's so, um, it destroys your confidence. So I would want to, and our, our group would want to see, um, you know, a facility almost where discussions are taking place with our colleges, you know, um, so that retraining, reskilling. But when you say to somebody who's, who's been in a particular sphere, of um, employment well you know you can always go and retrain and reskill that just makes people feel even more demoralized i think really um i i know some people now who want to start their own businesses would never have thought of having their own businesses or what i call a second career and um, through the covid i've seen older people who have thought, well, you know, it's not for me to get back into employment again, but I will. And I know that people are now looking forward to post-COVID. They want to turn their hobbies into perhaps some form of employment, be it, a, you know, a Welsh craft shop or a tapestry or something like that. So I think it is about working with people's individual and unique skills and working with our colleges. Um, you know, one third of old people have been lonely during lockdown and 55% of old people living by themselves were lonely um, during lockdown. So um, age discrimination is something that worries me. I've got I've got friends that say I'll never get another job, you know, at 50. And that is so. so I mean, they, they, they've still got many, many years of value and benefit to our local communities. So. Um, Whilst the Employment Equality Age Regulations 2006 prohibits discrimination in the workplace on the basis of someone's age, our bill would look to provide further um, protection of this right in law. Because I think, and it, you know, people will know that we have argued as a group to enshrine the rights of older people in legislation, and it has been very disappointing to have that voted down by the Welsh government. Um, we'd also introduce all age apprenticeships to help ease people back into the workplace. As the Old People's Commissioner with who I've worked, each different one, the Old People Commissioner, um, we all have a key role to play. Um, it's vital that people feel employed to do that. Um, I think we're all aware too that businesses themselves are not always aware that they're perhaps guilty of age discrimination it just doesn't figure and yet as far as I'm concerned I believe that people uh, bring far more value you need people of all backgrounds working in all sorts of, of different sort of industries working for themselves um, and I, I just think that we, we all should be working more collectively and, and it needs to be enshrined in legislation that age legislate age discrimination does not exist in Wales. Thank you, uh, Janet. Uh, uh, Julie, um, so some thoughts from, from you. Um, well, I think, I mean, the question is asking um, about helping older people re-enter the workplace. Well, I think the key issue is the country and we, we need older people uh, because we need their skills. I mean, the, what, you know, what some older people bring is, um, you know, is a wealth of experience, a whole range of skills. And I think it is stigma that stops um, us recognizing as a country the value of what older people bring. So I think it is really important that we work on that stigma that does exist um, and um, it must be challenged at every point. 
Um, the Welsh um, uh, Labour um, government um, has done um, quite a lot of work on this um, issue. And one of the issue is employers' attitudes to older people. And um, you've probably all heard of the people don't have a best before date, um, which is the campaign that the Welsh uh, government has run to encourage um, employers, to encourage uh, flexible employment um, so that older people can be willing, are willing to, you know, are comfortable with working maybe part time um, and to approach the whole thing uh, flexibly. So um, we, we're challenging that and we continue to challenge that. And then, of course, um, I think Janet uh, mentioned apprenticeships and all age apprenticeships um, we are very committed to. And in um, and it's we have got in a particular um, uh, range of uh, Welsh government um, apprenticeships where we do take specifically try to get people of over 50 to come and take up apprenticeships because I think that is very important and that is something that we want to um, continue um, to do. Um, we've also um, run uh, in conjunction with Working Wales um, special um, classes to encourage people who want to be their own boss um, and to encourage them in self-employment. So there is a whole range of initiatives, but I think it is there are much wider issues here. It is an issue of recognising the value and the worth of older people, and it is important to recognise them um, their rights. And that's why um, the Welsh government has commissioned research from Swansea University, which is looking at um, the rights over all areas and is waiting for a recommendation of how we move forward um, to whether we need a Human Rights Act in Wales, but we do need to ensure that the rights of older people are respected. Thank you, Julie. Um, the next question has been submitted by Linda Wallace. So over to you, Linda, to ask your question. Evening, everyone. Um, my name is Linda Wallace. I'm the chair of the Welsh Senate of Older People. Um, unpaid older carers have been struggling long before COVID-19 pandemic hit us. Over the last 12 months, their situation has worsened exponentially. How would you ensure that older carers are recognised and that the proper help and respite from their 24-7 caring responsibilities is brought to the front of the agenda should your party be in power after the election? Thank you, Linda, for your question. Uh, and I think I'll start with, with you, Julia, as the Welsh Government of this week published um, its strategy and national priorities for um, unpaid carers. So, so how, will, how will the strategy and the priorities published this week help the estimated 370,000 unpaid carers uh, across Wales, in particular uh, older carers, as, uh, as Linda's mentioned? Julie. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Linda, um, uh, very much. And I know what a contribution you make to this um, developing policy in this um, area. And it is um, absolutely crucial that we recognise the, um, the absolutely crucial role that um, unpaid carers carry out. And often, I mean, they do it for love, um, but we, you know, as politicians and as the government have to do all we possibly can um, to support them in that. Um, so we did um, publish our uh, strategy for carers today, um, and this has four priorities um, with actions for each one. And the first one is identifying and valuing unpaid carers, making sure that they've got information, advice and assistance and um, supporting life alongside caring, which is so important because, um, you know, unpaid carers can spend their whole time, um, you know, looking after um, their loved one and they're not complaining. But it is important that they have the opportunity to do things for themselves, you know, to do the sort of things that, um, you know, can make them help fulfil um, themselves. And then we have a final one supporting unpaid carers in education and in the workplace. But it's really important that we make sure that the local authorities on the health boards do their bit for carers. And we have got the legislation in place, the Social Services and Wellbeing um, Act, which is person-centred. Um, carers um, can have their own assessment as well as the person who's cared for. Um, and this is particularly important for older carers that they recognise that they have the right to services. They have the right to help from the local authorities. 
Um, and I know that um, the legislation, I think we've got the legislation absolutely right, but in translating it into practice, we still have to work very hard at that to make that happen. And the sort of information we've had from things like measuring the mountain and different things shows that there are gaps in the way that that is actually implemented. So we have, um, uh, you know, uh, put out for next year the amount of money that goes to local authorities in order to help um, fulfill their duties towards um, unpaid carers. And we also, um, of course, fund um, uh, carers' charities and lots of sort of specific projects um, for carers in addition to what goes to um, the local authority. But um, we do want to increase the availability of respite um, to carers because, you know, they want to keep going and we just want to help them, you know, to keep going. And respite in not the conventional sense, I think, where you think of, um, you know, a person who's cared for going off to stay in, um, you know, in, in a residential accommodation for a while, which may be suitable, you know, for some people, but we want to look at it in a completely different way. Um, and I, I went to Scotland to see what they were doing in Scotland, and they've got this, I think they call it the um, respitality there, where they work with the uh, holiday industry, the tourist industry, to make opportunities. Well, maybe the carer and the cared want to go away together, or maybe the person who's um, doing the caring wants to go to um, a class, to, you know, you know, an um, art class or so, something like that, you know. And we are... Um, uh, we haven't fully published our manifesto yet, but we will be committing to ensure that we can develop um, uh, respite, uh, respite opportunities much more than are available now. And also what we did do in the pandemic was um, set up um, um, a million and a quarter um, uh, fund uh, for short term needs that carers um, might have, um, you know, just getting a, buying a device or um, uh, um, helping with the heating bills, that was a huge issue for everybody, and especially if you're stuck in all the time. And we are going to continue um, in the, to the future some of those things like that that we brought in as emergencies in the pandemic. So I hope we will be able to improve things for um, unpaid carers because it's so important that, um, and I think it is recognised now, the pandemic has made us recognise them, but we've got to respond in a determined way. So thank you, Linda. <laughs> thank you, Julie. Uh, Janet, if you were in government after the election, how would you prioritise unpaid carers? Well, let me tell you, I've been really busy today, so I haven't read um, the strategy that Julie's mentioning. But I can tell you, in 10 years that I have been a member of the Senate or the Assembly, I've seen numerous strategies and my first actions would be to literally take those words out of all those strategies and turn those into actions. Because too often we write, you know, not we, but government writes up strategies and people say to me, it's not strategies we need, it's actual help. And I find that some of the people, I see some really heart rendering scenes here, local people um, who I will stumble upon if I'm out and about doing a doorstep surgery or indeed during the pandemic, when they phoned me about something else. And when I start talking about their own particular circumstances, it can often start off with an unpaid carer supporting a loved one. And then in the end, because of the lack of support of them, they almost become that they need support. They, it just completely demoralizes, um, it drains. And so we need more rehabilitation. We need more recognition that um, there's an expectation up by government for people to come forward. Have you ever spoken to some of these people? They are fiercely independent. They're fiercely private about their own affairs, but there's a natural assumption of government that if people want help, they'll come and ask for it. They don't. And so there has to be a more joined up approach, working with social care, working with the local authority. You can find out anything about anyone as either a local authority or a government if you want to find that information out. I was speaking to a gentleman last week who's wife is very very poorly and he's really struggling now doesn't claim any carers allowance didn't know there was carers allowance and so I'm looking after him now with that but why are people not realizing or knowing that there's this financial support for them why are they not made aware of of um 
the rehabilitation schemes for them. They need respite because it really is a difficult. It, it's it, it's such um, a vacation to look after even your most loved one. I, you know, especially when you're getting older and you're not well yourself, it's a real drain on their own abilities and their own mental health. So, um, you know, as I've mentioned about respite, um, Carers Wales have estimated that the number of carers in Wales had increased from 400,000 to 680,000 during the pandemic, equating to one in five people of Wales. So what extra measures has the Welsh Government put in during the pandemic? Or, you know, I mean, it's equating to £33 million a day. Uh, their survey suggested that 80% of respondents said they're providing more care now than they were before the start of the pandemic. 76% said the person they care for needs more support. And many of them, when pressed, will say they need support. Um, our manifesto will make it very clear that the mechanism that we would use to undertake line the rights of our unpaid carers which does that would touch on the older people's rights bill. So let's forget the strategies and let's put into a rights bill um, the support that our carers need. Um, COVID-19 management plan, which looks to urgently establish routes to support people suffering with mental health problems from the pandemic, especially NHS staff and care workers from providing palliative care and those suffering bereavement who weren't able to say, I mean, the most appalling thing that's happened during this is when people have had to see their loved ones either admitted to hospital or a care home and then have not been able to say their goodbyes and that's after mm. years of caring for them there's been nobody or nothing has really you know enveloped that situation and said well, there's something we have to do about this we've you know I just feel that these people are often in social isolation themselves and that, that has to stop. Greater communication. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Arreen, what are the orders by Cymru and Aid? Thank you, Linda, for the, uh, for the question. And, and you're right, you know, during COVID, this has a problem that's been made much worse. I wrote to Welsh Government um, about this actually not that long ago. I haven't had a response yet, but uh, I, I mentioned two particular cases involving constituents. One uh, a woman who was caring for her husband with dementia who'd become um, violent during the, um, uh, an aggressive during, during lockdown um, and was told she couldn't uh, be helped. Another one uh, who was looking for respite she was caring for a uh, husband with, with Parkinson's, again told she couldn't get um, respite during the pandemic. But what was crucial about that particular case was that she'd been asking uh, for a not receiving respite since August 2018. So this isn't just a matter of getting things back to normal after COVID, as you say. You know, this is about rebuilding a new um, framework for respite. And what I'd really like to do in, in government is you know, lead some really innovative uh, thinking on how we absolutely make sure that uh, a right to respite is, is enshrined, um, that um, there is communication to people about help that may be available uh, to them uh, and they may not know about it, but also how to deliver in an innovative way, um, respite care that is uh, cost efficient, because you know that's important with, with this as, as with all aspects of, of health and care, but is also effective in giving people that help that they need. Because you know we say it time and time again, our whole systems would collapse uh, without uh, unpaid uh, carers. The system, which is already under immense strain, would not be able to cope at all if it wasn't mm. for unpaid carers. So it's such uh, a, a sensible investment as well as being the right thing to do to make sure that the pressure is kept off unpaid carers uh, as much as possible. Diolch, diolch um, the next question has been submitted by Howard um, Thomas and his question is, even before COVID-19, many older people struggled to get timely GP appointments. What policies and practices would you put in place to approve access to GPs? Janet, I'll start with you. How would the Welsh Conservatives ensure easier access to GP and, and primary care? 
Well, thank you. I think following COVID, the first thing I would do, you know, if we were in government, you know, and I was all in that portfolio, I would want to have a, a discussion with GPs to see how they have fared during COVID. Because have I even had uh, my, some of my constituents saying it's actually easier now to get a GP's appointment? They might not see them, but they'll speak to them on the phone. So the GPs appear to me at the moment during COVID to be able to get through more or people that they're actually, you know, having a conversation with. Um, so I think that, that the discussions, you know, whether GPs will ever go back to, you know, the face-to-face -face appointments, just those, or whether they, there will be a hybrid thing, you know, where they can actually, if, if you want to speak to your GP, you do not want to be told, well, you've got to ring between eight and nine. And if you don't, if you don't manage it by nine o'clock in the morning, um, you're not going to get an appointment that day. If people are worried and actually reach out and want a GP's appointment, they want it as soon as possible. So I think these new ways of working that have had to be adhered to during COVID, there may be some, some learning to come out of that that means we can increase the productivity almost of our GPs, um, you know, by, by using different methods. Um, we've also, I don't think it's just GPs, it's access to medical treatments per se, because there's an increase on GPs. If, if I've got a constituent that's been waiting 18 months for a hip and they're in crucial pain, in that 18 months, they'll probably just about that one issue, go and see their GPs over that 18 month period, four or five times. There's a lot of duplication for our GPs when people cannot access appointments. So we, we've been calling on the Welsh Labour Government to publish a recovery plan for the Welsh NHS. And it does, must include three key commitments. We've got to clear the backlog in treatments and ensure that no one has to make, wait. And I hate saying this, wait more than one year for treatment. That's still too long, but we have to be realistic. We need to recruit at least 1,200 doctors and 2,000 nurses to reduce those waiting times. We've got to transform our mental health by treating it um, as the same importance as physical health. And again, I've heard lots of discussions about this in the Senate and in real terms, people underestimate that I'm getting, I mean, when I've spoken to my local GPs throughout this pandemic, they've admitted to me that the number of um, contacts they've had with old people about mental health issues now, whereas, you know, it used to be more physical and the amount of medications that they've had to mm. prescribe as a result of the pandemic. Um, over recent weeks, I've asked the Minister to consider proposals by the Royal Chair of GPs in Wales to support the provision of a dedicated mental health worker at each GP practice across Wales so that they could deal specifically with those uh, mental health issues. Um, I also support the role of a North Wales medical school um, that, that would help us here in my constituency with the recruitment uh, crisis. And um, Welsh Conservatives are deeply concerned about that public transport has been left to falter under Welsh Labour. And believe it or not, it can be really difficult to access GP appointments, you know, post-COVID or pre-COVID, if you can't actually, if you're in a rural community and you can't get a bus to your GP. So that it, there's a whole host of issues out there that need addressing. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and, and Julie, how, how would um, a Labour government post-election um, address um, some of the issues that, that Janet has, has raised? Julie, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think, um, uh, be well, before, um, uh, before the coronavirus pandemic, I mean, this issue was obviously very important about how people will get, um, can get access, particularly to primary care as the question um, referred to. And in March, 2019, um, uh, the Minister of Health and Social Services, Vaughan Gettin, announced um, the General Medical Services Access Standards, um, which we expect all G practices um, to meet. Um, now the aim was for those to be met by March, 2021. Um, but the pandemic um, obviously came along and there's been another year now 
we are expecting them at the end of that of an, another year to comply with all those um, access standards. And if they do, I think it will improve things enormously. Um, I think it does vary by um, uh, GP practice to GP practice, how um, easy or difficult it is to actually um, get an appointment and to get um, access. Um, but these standards, I mean, there's a whole list of these standards. Um, if I just tell you um, a couple of them, people receive a prompt response to their contact with the GP practice via telephone. Um, practices have the appropriate telephony systems in place to support the needs of people, avoiding the need to call back multiple times and we'll check that they are handling calls um, in this way. I mean, I think that's absolutely crucial because I know from my own experience that um, sometimes to get an appointment, you have to phone all day virtually, mm. and that is just not right. Um, so when these standards come in, that will not happen. So Labour is committed to seeing that that um, doesn't happen. Um, we believe that there should be bilingual information um, on, the, um, on the responses. Um, and people should be able to access information um, on how to get help and advice and the GP surgery should be going out to people to ensure that they have that information. Um, and um, a, a range of options should be available for them to contact their GP um, practice and email can be used. And the important thing really is I think for the GPs and all the people around them, because obviously it's multidisciplinary as a GP surgery, mm -hmm. that they understand the needs of their patients. And it's that bond. I mean, because the GP um, has always been held up, hasn't it, as a, as, um, you know, a, a sort of ideal situation uh, because of the, um, you know, the bond and understanding between the patient and the GP. But I think uh, these standards, which um, Labour has um, said, um, have to be maintained, will have to be introduced in some in some places. Those will ensure that communication with um, with the GP practices can be standardised and can be measured and ca can be held to account. So we will be doing that. Diolch, uh, Julie. Uh, um, Green. Beth am cynllun ni y Plai Cymru, de? Beth oedd y Plai Cymru ni ydym mwyn sicrhau bren haws i rhywun i gael em, y pwyntiad i, i weli meddig teulu? Ie, yeah, diolch yn fawr iawn. Mi, mi na'i sôn am dri peth. Uh, un yn ymwneud â gweithlu. Um, mae angen i ni gael rhagor o uh, bobl yn y gweithlu iechyd, yn feddygon a gweithwyr iechyd proffesiynol eraill. Mi fyddech chi wedi clywed Plaid Cymru yn sôn ers blynyddoedd am yr angen am fil o'r feddygon pum mil o nyrsys y gweithwyr eraill. Um, ac yn sicr mae'n ymgyrch lwyddiannus ni uh, i gyflwyno addysg feddygol yn y gogledd wedi bod yn, yn gam uh, tuag at wireddu hynny. Dwi'n falch iawn hefyd o weld y cydwadwyr o'r diwedd yn, yn, yn uh, ymuno a ni yn cefnogi uh, hynny. Um, uh, felly mae hynny, mae hynny'n rhywbeth sydd ar draws uh, iechyd a, a gofal angen i, i draws newid. Dwi'n meddwl yn agwedd ni tuag at um, uh, y, y gweithlu. Uh, Mae'r gweithlu fel da ni wedi weld yn y blwyddyn ddiwetha wedi bod yn cario lot gormod o bwysa. Just oh, far cario. too much pressure just to keep services running in primary care and that has been very, very apparent. The second matter is developing what we've learned over the past year. It is possible by using technology to get more patients passing through the surgery. But of course, referring back to the first question we heard, very many people are not able or uncomfortable using that technology. I have an idea of creating a new role within the healthcare system, something like a, a digital health assistant, for example, that would mean then that it would be possible to take technology out to people's houses. Yes, I can have a consultation here in my home because I'm comfortable to, but possibly it might be an idea for get, to get somebody to bring the technology to someone who isn't able to. So they don't have to worry about using a technology and they can only, only have to be concerned about speaking to the doctor or nurse about what the problem is. So, and the third then is changing culture. People still approach me and say, I'm having difficulty, difficulty seeing my GP. And I ask, well, why do you want to see a GP? Well, because I'm not well. 
well, you know, why do you need to see a GP? So that change really into realizing that it's not necessarily about seeing the GP every time, but seeing someone from the healthcare workforce and the primary care workforce who can see you because there's so much that a nurse or an advanced nurse practitioner has to offer or or a, a ph pharmacist, a community pharmacist. There is a wide range of methods for us to get access to health services. And so there's still a, a culture change and communication change with people required that it's not necessarily only the GP who you need to see so that we can let GPs get on with what they need to be doing. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. I think the panelists will be pleased to hear we've reached the final um, question this evening. And, and this question would be asked by Steve Milsom. And I think this question is probably one of the key questions that political parties will have to address in their manifesto um, this year. So over to you, Steve. Thanks very, very much indeed. And good evening, all. Um, I'm Steve Milsom. I'm chair of Cymru Older People's Alliance, which is the national charity for the 50 plus forums around Wales. Um, the issue of paying for care has been kicked into the long grass by successive governments over the last two decades, despite the significant uh, detriment to older people, particularly those suffering from dementia. So my question is, what solutions would your party introduce in Wales to solve this issue on a fair, equitable and sustainable basis? And what priority would you give it? Thank you, Steve, for your, for your question. Uh, uh, Julie, the Minister for Health and Social Services offered an update to the to the Senate last week, didn't he, on, the, uh, on paying um, for, for social care. Maybe you had to share some of his, his, um, his, his, his thoughts with, uh, with us this evening. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, we've had a group, um, uh, interministerial group, looking at uh, paying for social care um, for a... Uh, well, quite a number of years. Um, I joined it when I took up um, this post. Um, we were about to go out to public consultation when the um, pandemic struck, so we weren't able to do that um, consultation. But what um, Vaughan um, said, well, in the statement really, he laid out all the different options and the different costings that, um, uh, that uh, would be needed. Um, and he explained um, that the sums of money um, needed to put social care on the same basis as health care, of being free of the point of delivery, which we would like to see, ideally, um, are very large indeed. Um, we'd need um, 700 million or another 3.5p on tax to deliver the equivalent to the NHS in free care. And that's before we get into the differentials in staff um, wages. Um, uh, we felt um, as a group that um, we had got a whole range of uh, scenarios of what could be done, uh, all costed. Um, we didn't think that in the middle of a pandemic, um, with its um, economic shock, is the best time to be increasing Welsh taxes. Um, but we do, ex you know, this is something that may be necessary um, in the future, because I think you're absolutely right, this is something that has got to be solved. Um, and I think we've got all those, um, the, as I say, we've got all the information put there together. Um, but one of the things that has to be um, tackled in making um, social care more effective and um, fairer is the um, wages and the conditions of the uh, social care staff who are such so poorly paid for doing one of the most valuable jobs you could have looking, you know, looking after our frail elderly citizens. Um, so Labour is committed to um, ensuring that uh, they, uh, social care workers, all get the real living wage. And we will introduce that um, in the next uh, session. And we will introduce um, a um, social care framework, which will provide a national um, body at the centre in government, um, which will look at um, terms and conditions and will look at generally at a strategy of how we're going to um, work uh, to develop um, social care in a fair sort of way. Um, we do think that if we could, it could have been, you know, if we could do this in conjunction um, with um, the UK government, 
um, with a taxation solution for the whole of the UK, that that um, would be good to do. But if um, that doesn't happen, um, we will have to go ahead and do something and in terms, probably in terms of taxation or a levy in this next um, session. We're also um, very committed to the um, aim of keeping older people at home um, for even longer than they're kept at home now, because really that has been transformed um, recently, hasn't it? Over People are staying at home with help in a way that they never, never did before. And we'd like that to go even further. So we'd like to have capital input and we are planning to do this um, part of our um, commitments to develop um, extra care facilities and build up the um, opportunity for older people to stay in their own homes or in suitable independent um, living for much longer than happens at the moment. So in summary, we're committed to providing more extra care if we are um, fortunate enough to be in government again for the next five years. We're committed to paying the real living wage to social care workers and we're committed to making a long-term solution uh, to social care in terms of the um, amount of money that's needed to, to make a, a better system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janet. Thanks. Conservatives have ruled out a social care tax, um, haven't they? So, so, so how would the Conservatives pay for social care if they were in government? Thanks, uh, Rodri. Well, when I was the Shadow Minister for Social Care, I held a series of forums on social care and particularly on the funding aspects. And it was incredible um, when getting around the table with many stakeholders working in social care of the key themes that came out. And one of the fundamental key themes that came out was that the care budget, social care and local authorities are picking up the tab for a lot of delays in terms of health services and in terms of quite often when people get into needing care, it's at a pretty high expensive level. So putting interventions in sooner that cost less over a wider basis would be the way forward. Now, social adult care is... It is facing a crisis in Wales and it's not just happened this term. It's been building upon building and it has been disappointing when UK government have sent over Barnet consequentials, for instance, and those haven't been spent in the direction of travel that they should have been on health and social care. So, you know, we need to get people more through the health system faster. You know, I know elderly people who, you know, through immobility and, and poor mobility and in pain, they fall, they end up in very expensive hospital care and then in even more expensive social care. We should be looking to more interventions um, at that. There's little within the, the Welsh budget now to suggest that the Welsh Labour-led government is looking for a long-term solution to the issue. Instead, they're relying now on the integrated care fund to fill those gaps. But even its total investment is maintained at 89 million for the second financial year. So really, they've allowed this backlog of money that's been needed on social care over the years to build. And we're now sitting, you know, very much on a ticking time bomb. And despite huge pressures on social care services during COVID-19, the main force of funding for local authorities, the local government settlement, um, is going to be smaller than 2021. So, um, you know, it, it's a top priority for any incoming government. Um, the Audit Wales estimates that by 2035, the number of people aged above 65 who are unable to manage at least one domestic task um, on their own will rise by 46%. So our manifesto, I'm not going to give anything away today because you'll see it all soon, but our manifesto will outline a number of policies, including wraparound care delivery. But I'm going to say something here tonight. The one thing our constituents, our patients, our, those re receiving care need, they want to see more uh, across all party working. And I am really disappointed in the health minister because when I was in the post uh, just before COVID, called into the office and we were going to all work and look at social care funding. We were gonna look at it cross party collectively. So we would all go in that line of travel and not one party go off on a tangent and say, aren't we clever, look what we're doing. 
I would tell you this now, that whoever is elected in that next government in the sixth term, they have to reach out and work across all political parties and ensure that that, you know, that party politics is taken out of this because our most elderly, our vulnerable and even our young people needing social care. We are talking about those with real deserving needs and it's fundamental for any anybody in a political position or indeed in government to ensure that, you know, you do not let party politics get in the way. And I have been quite disappointed to see over the years how it has been almost like a political football. So Thanks. I would ask anyone sat here or anybody who's going Janet. into government that we work on it cross party. Thank you, Janet. And, and Andreen, I, I know um, Plaid have been working uh, and have published a plan on paying for social care about eight, 18 months ago, haven't they? Yep, and I'll hold uh, Janet to her offer to help us uh, deliver the- Sorry, 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 Irene. Um, Julie, you need to uh, um, unmute yourself. Yes, I'm just, I'm awfully sorry. I'll have yes. to um, leave now. Um, so just thank you very much. Thank and you very much. Thank I'm you very much for I'm all for working cross-party. <laughs> Bye then. Thank you. No star. No oh, star. Sorry, Irene. Yeah, I was just uh, going to say I'll, I'll hold Janet to her offer to work with us on implementing the work. Uh, the recommendations that came out of a fantastic piece of work, actually, that was um, carried out by the Plaid Cymru Care Commission over a period of uh, about 18 months. And yeah, I, I cannot stress um, enough how much of a priority this is uh, for us. Um, you're quite right that we have waited far too long for action on something that you know we, we hear successive governments say in principle they support sorting out but but eventually end up doing nothing about it and put out a statement you know just before uh, an election that they're going to do it next time well um let's uh, let's sort out a few anomalies i mean you've you've mentioned sort of dementia there Stephen. your question uh, and the fact that you get your care uh, for free if it's cancer, you don't if it's dementia. You know, this is finishing off the work of an Aaron Bevan in, in, in many ways. Uh, and, you know, as I say, I can't stress how, how determined we are to, to, to resolve that sort of equity of treatment between health and care. We want to create a national health and care service. Um, which does an, a number of things, which you know formalizes, uh, you know, gives clear frameworks for integration and, and joining budgets uh, for, for local delivery of health and, and care together. It, it makes sure that you look after the workforce in bringing care uh, work workers up to the same terms and conditions as those working in health, and you close those anomalies uh, in terms of. Uh, what you pay for and what you don't. Now we have made it clear that we want to introduce uh, free social care at the point of, of need. I am uh, convinced that it can be done from uh, general taxation. Clearly the current economic climate doesn't make that any easier um, uh, after the, the past year. So my commitment is right, we sit down immediately after um, the election, not to decide whether to do it, but which of the options to do it. Uh, the big figures on increasing costs of social care. Yes, there, there are major challenges, but that's if we try to deliver free care with things as they are. And we need a transformation. We need to look at the preventative like we've never done it before. We need to do things like uh, bring in a levy on unhealthy foods as we have done with sugary drinks, make the population more, uh, more healthy. That takes time. It takes prioritization in budgets as well, which is what I want to, to do. And uh, yeah, we'll look at the options, but the key thing is we'll do it immediately. And it's not a matter of uh, if, but uh, how. Yeah. Lovely. Dioch. Well, dyna diwedd uh, y sesiwn heno. Dioch yn fawr iawn i chi benelwyr. Thank you, Janet. Dioch, Rina, and thanks also um, to Julie, who has, who has just left us. Dioch yn fawr i'r, i'r cyfieithu sydd bod yn gweithio yn galed heno ac ac i Orchard Media uh, hefyd. Um, dwi'n creu byddwn ni gyd am ddiolch uh, yn arbennig i Age Cymru, dwi'n credu, am, am drefnu um, am sicrhau bod y noson yn digwydd heno, a hefyd i ddiolch i Age Cymru am ei gwaith diflino dros cyfnod y pandemig yn arbennig yn helpu a, a chynorthwyo pobl uh, hyn yng Nghymru. Felly, diolch yn fawr iawn uh, Age Cymru. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a pleasant evening. No star da boche. Thank you. Bye.